Learning Center, and he is the co-organizer of this event, and he's going to talk about regulatory incentives towards decentralization. Let's give the speaker a welcome. Thank you, everyone. So uh, hopefully this will be a fun one. I sort of um, decided to go for it with uh, strange metaphors and old history of philosophy of law and things like that, but it, it should still stay relevant, I think. And then the other disclaimer I was going to make is a lot of this will be semi-U.S. focused, and I, I actually think there's probably a majority of non-U.S. people in the room, which is awesome right now. Um, but the concepts that I'm discussing from a regulatory standpoint easily apply more broadly to securities laws, uh, anti-money laundering laws that exist in almost every country around the world in a fairly similar uh, form. So with that disclosure, um, I wanted to start with uh, this awesome illustration. Do, does anyone recognize it? This is, yeah. so th th this is the, the front piece from Hobbes's Leviathan. It was uh, drawn by a French uh, illustrator, I believe, uh, for the publication of Hobbes's treatise on basically justifying the, the power of the state. And, um, and what's cool about it is it's made out of people, like Soylent Green. There's just lots of little people. And they're all facing inward um, to form some sort of civil association. And Hobbes used this sort of vaguely contract-like theory to justify the power of the state, of course. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a cool image. I don't have too much to say about it other than that it definitely raises the topic of decentralization, that a sovereign is, is itself a, a body of, of individuals. Um, and we'll have more to say about Hobbes in a second. So what do I mean by regulatory incentives towards decentralization? Uh, when you hear someone in the economics literature or the legal literature usually talk about incentives from government, you're usually thinking of things like subsidies, like an actual payment from the government to some person or group of persons that's engaging in an activity that the government would like to see more of um, because it's socially beneficial or maybe because government's corrupt and wants to support some private interest, so it pays them. And so these can be good or bad, but government gives money in the US, for example, to the space launch system, which is this attempt to build a replacement for the space shuttle um, out of the same parts the space shuttle was made out of. This is, this is how the SLS is. I mean, there, there's innovation going on in SLS, too. I see someone like, like, <laughs> like thinking. I don't, I don't mean to impugn the SLS too much, but there's definitely an interesting reason why maybe the government would want to hand money to the SLS project rather than SpaceX, like Elon Musk's startup. It's because congressmen have, several Congress people, have the factories in their districts that made the old space shuttle parts. And the idea that those factories are going to close because we're not using the space shuttle anymore is frustrating. So, you know, it's a subsidy. Is it good? Is it bad? Might be bad. Of course, you can get subsidized by the government to buy a Tesla, a really fancy luxury car with this, these, like, cool doors. Um, but, you know, maybe this is good because it's stimulating innovation into battery technology that will ultimately mean that one day everyone can afford a Tesla and then we won't have gas guzzling vehicles and we might do some, uh, you know, positive things with respect to climate change, maybe. Um, seems kind of desperate at this point, but, you know, maybe. And then uh, this is a personal example from Washington, D.C., where I'm from, because I've got to be where the regulators are. That's what Coin Center does, is we educate regulators about the technology. This is the D.C. streetcar. Has anyone ridden on the D.C. streetcar? Yeah. Even if I said that in D.C., everyone would shake their head, because the bus is faster, and this thing, uh, it often breaks down, but because it's on rails, they can't move it. And then it blocks traffic on H Street because it's a streetcar in traffic. And this is all new stuff. Like, San Francisco's had streetcars forever, and they actually work pretty well. In D.C., we were like, oh, hipsters like streetcars. Maybe it'll bring, like, gentrification to this neighborhood. I don't think they said it like that, but, you know, that was the implication. It was a lot of real estate developers who pushed for this because it's charming and stupid. Uh, so that's a bad, that, that's definitely, I think that's non-contentiously a bad subsidy. Uh, but this was all just my um, uh, hopefully vaguely amusing comedy routine on subsidies. Uh, the question, should we give um, people in our space subsidies? I think no. 
I think probably not. Uh, maybe we can have a conversation about that, but that's not what this talk about is about anyway. I'm talking about regulatory incentives, not in the form of subsidies, but a lack or an absence of regulatory taxes. And my argument is that in the US at least, and increasingly in the rest of the world, we actually have a very good regime with respect to cryptocurrencies and open blockchain networks that abstains from taxing through regulation those networks, which makes them more competitive than they otherwise would be as compared to the legacy financial services that they're replacing, whether it's things like the traditional banks or things like that. Not calling that subsidy kind of an exercise in semantics? I mean, do, 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 is a subsidy... I am a lawyer, Joe. <laughs> but, but yeah, please. Is a subsidy only to actively <coughs> check or can it be to not tax? I mean, that, that is a tax subsidy, right? I'm sorry, say it one more time. It seems like if you aren't taxing as a matter of policy because you want this tech to get off the ground, that mm -hmm. is... Just... Yeah, I agree. I think the inverse is also true just of simple... Yeah, yeah. So, what I really mean is these are regulatory taxes. If you issue a security in the United States, you're going to spend money on your S-1 or maybe on finding a lawyer to explain why you can get an exemption from filing a normal disclosure. It's going to be a very expensive process. And those costs are effectively a tax on people who would want to otherwise issue securities. Uh, another example, um, if you want to do money transmission in the United States, you're going to have to spend lots of money on an anti-money laundering program and get licenses in the 53 states and territories that require licenses for that activity. That's a very expensive regulatory tax that we have in the US. And so what I'm saying is maybe if you provide a similar service as regulated entities but don't meet the statutory definition of money transmission or securities issuance, then there's less money you need to pay in compliance and you get a regulatory incentive. Now the naive view of what I just said or the simple view of what I just said is that that's actually kind of cynical because this looks like we're just finding a clever way around the statutory definition uh, through rhetoric or chicanery is the term we use in the law to argue that, you know, well, this isn't that because it's got a token associated with it, or this isn't that because it's got blockchain, or this isn't that because, in Angela's words yesterday, this isn't an intermediary. This is some other thing in the middle. It's not an intermediary. And that sounds like bad faith. And I don't intend to suggest, actually, that we're getting these incentives in bad faith. I think we're actually getting these incentives for the right reasons. And part of our job at Coin Center is to explain to people in government how these technologies work and why maybe for the right reasons they don't fit into the existing laws, at least not all of the existing laws. Because it's really only cynical to say that that's a regulatory incentive if you think that the law that you're getting around is essentially a bad law. So it depends on how you feel about securities laws and state licensing and anti-money laundering policy. Um, if we're just like finding a way around it because we think it's bullshit, to use probably the right term that somebody who feels that would use, um, then it's cynical. And this is, you know, this is not a new crypto anarchist belief. People have questioned the necessariness or the usefulness of laws for a long time. Even Thomas Hobbes, from our first uh, slide, uh, wrote in Leviathan, unnecessary laws are not good laws, but traps for money. They're just rent seeking. They're just trying to make the field more complicated for people who would otherwise want to do something so they can extract rents from those people. And St. Augustine, uh, this is just one of my favorite quotes, said, without justice, what are kingdoms but great bands of robbers? So the question is, between anti-money laundering law, securities law, and state money transmission licensing laws, are any of these unnecessary, in which case they're just traps for money, or unjust, in which case we should see them as effectively a type of robbery? And this is how I feel. I do not think that anti-money laundering law 
or securities law as they're currently enforced in the US are either unjust or unnecessary. With respect to state money transmission licensing law, I have mixed feelings. I think maybe these are bad laws, actually. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about state money transmission licensing, because it, at some level, it's a very parochial US problem. And if you're interested, we have this report at this web address that explains all the problems with state money transmission licensing. But the basic intuition here is if you're doing something with cryptocurrency, you're holding other people's bitcoins, for example, you're engaging in a, in a global system, let alone a system that will be both in New York and California. So why would you choose the states as the level of regula regulation for licensing? Uh, what it really means is if, if you're Coinbase, for example, or uh, Kraken, and you know, I don't, I, I'm more interested in the underlying technology. I don't care too much about the businesses built on top of it, but I don't want the businesses built on top of it having to go through absurd hoops just to operate. So if you're any of those exchanges, you have to get licensed in 53 different states and territories. And that's just ridiculous because the 53rd time that you submit a criminal background check from yourself and your board members is not going to catch the crimes that the other 52 criminal background checks didn't catch. And you're already going to hold the minimum capitalization requirements of whichever state has the largest minimum capitalization requirements. So having another application and another application for money transmission licensing makes no sense. Should we license exchanges to make sure they don't lose customer funds? Like, Bit, uh, I just said Bitfinex. I meant Mt. Gox. That's an interesting Freudian slip. <laughs> um, yes, maybe licensing is a good way to address those consumer protection concerns. But I think it should be done either at the state level, uh, at the federal level, uh, which is what we talk about in this paper, or we could do something like they do in the European Union with e-money licenses, where you get one license in one state and you can passport it to other member states of the federal or the larger um, polity. Anyway, so I think, I think actually state licenses that still currently exist in the US is kind of unjust and kind of unnecessary. Yes? Is there a private business around the processing of state money licenses? They're called lawyers. Uh, do you mean you mean the actual accepting the applications? And so there is a there is actually a trade association um, called the Money Transmitters Regulators Association and the S State Conference of Bank Supervisors. There's two trade associations of regulators, and they meet and they talk about how they make a maybe could make the application process more unified amongst all the states and easier. They don't make too much progress. And you know, I don't mean to be cynical again or, or malicious, but when your incentives are to not make your state's you know, regulatory budget irrelevant because another state's now doing it and you've got a reciprocity agreement or something, you're not going to move quickly to make yourself irrelevant. And so there, there are some bad public choice incentives that have, that have allowed this, this regime to continue far longer than it's obviously reasonable. Like money transmission licensing was originally something that you'd need if you were opening a corner store in, I don't know, San Antonio, Texas, where you were going to do like bill paying for people who wanted to come in with cash and then send a wire. And that's like a very local business with a local clientele that's vulnerable. It makes sense to have a local regulator. That's not what PayPal's like at all, let alone Coinbase. So that old geographic distribution of regulatory power doesn't make sense anymore. And it really just becomes a trap for money rather than a just regulation, I would say. There are consultants, though, who will do the licensing for you. Oh, yes. It's a, a huge cottage industry. Uh, and, and it shouldn't exist if we had good regulation here, if we had a single license that did all the protections that we would want, rather than 53 redundant licenses. Have we seen, though, like the, any realistic chance of the federal government actually doing this, or can the states <coughs> justly argue that they're regulating something that the yeah. paralyzed to do? So, so th the issue is uh, you'd need to figure out which regulator does this, and no regulator has a clear statutory mandate to create a federal license as an alternative to state licenses for money transmission. Um, the, the obvious candidates are just the, the OCC, which charters federal banks, but 
money transmitters aren't banks. So it's not really their legal purview to, st to stick their neck out and do that. And the CFTC would be a good choice for crypto specific stuff because we're treating these things often like commodities now. The CFTC already, already regulates derivatives markets for underlying, for contracts with co uh, uh, commodities underlying them. It doesn't regulate spot markets like what Coinbase is where it's just non-derivative trades. But they'd have the expertise to do it, but they'd also need new authority from Congress to regulate a spot market versus a derivative market. There is a bill um, that will likely be introduced soon that would actually propose that kind of power for the CFTC to regulate spot markets for those who want to get out of the state money transmission licensing system. Now, whether that passes, I'm not so sure. And if you want, there's that report that I wrote about federal alternatives. We describe a couple of different ways you could do it. Anyway, so we're going to ignore state licensing for the rest of the talk uh, and focus on these two big ones, which again have analogs in every country around the world. So even though I'm talking about the SEC and the Treasury, we're talking about anti-money laundering regulation like FATF in Europe and, and, and globally. And we're talking about uh, securities regulation, which seems like more of a US concern because our securities laws appear to be drafted in a broader sense. But I think it's not naive to believe that, um, say, the German security regulator, Baffin, seeing the experience in the US, decides to extend the, the breadth of their securities laws. They're definitely thinking about that. Uh, so a few things uh, that I want to lay out first as far as um, unnecessary and unjust laws, because just talking about those things in the abstract is like, well, that's just your opinion, dude. Um, so maybe we can develop, without going too deep into legal philosophy, or economics of law or public choice theory develops some ideas about when laws are necessary and when they are just or unjust. Um, so the first concept I want to introduce is a very old one called Pigovian taxation from this British uh, economist, Arthur Pigou. Um, he was writing back in the 1800s. At the time, people were building factories to make drastically cheaper consumer goods. But, and, and, and industrial products, but at the same time, these factories were spreading soot all over London. Um, the moths in London actually evolved from white moths to black moths in order to camouflage against the soot-covered buildings. There were selection pressures, and they evolved. It was that bad. Um, so Pigou is thinking, all right, um, it's clear that these factories are selling goods, uh, and the goods have a certain price, and and yet there's also some other hidden costs in the way industrial production has progressed. And those costs are not being borne by either the factory or the consumer buying the factory's goods. They're being borne by society. They are socialized costs of having soot everywhere. And Pigou called this a negative externality, building off of the earlier economic war work of Marshall. And Pigou said, all right, well, if we can quantify a social cost and a negative externality from a particular activity, then we should be able to tax that person who's creating that social cost to the amount of the negative externality. And that will create an incentive for them to either stop producing the negative externality, or we can use the tax revenue to you know, amend or repair the damage that's being done by their negative externality. And so this is a good idea, I think, generally speaking. This is a decent way of looking at regulation. Um, we've got much more advanced theories now, but actually this, this formative nugget is still key to most public choice theory about regulation. And then the other principle I want to explain is this principle that comes mostly from tort law, but you see it in the law and economics literature of the least cost avoider. I love this picture because this picture, you need only look at it and feel like things have changed drastically in, in how we entertain ourselves. This is people who decided to spend their, I don't know, Saturday afternoon watching motorcycles with sidecars with lions in them go around a so-called wall of death, which is this circular wall that if you go fast enough on a motorcycle, you can go sideways. Walls of death still exist. I don't think you can find a place uh, where you can view them where there isn't like a big cage separating the viewers from the rapidly moving motorcycles. And I don't think, uh, I mean, feel free to correct me if anyone knows otherwise. I don't think you can find lions uh, in sidecars in the walls of death anymore that still exist within society. Anyway, 
I bring up this fanciful thing from the past in that dangerous situations are often addressed through tort law, which is where, you know, if that step was improperly marked or a little bit too high, a little bit too low, and I trip over it and break my nose, then I sue uh, Alessandro or Berkeley or someone because there was negligence. And th this, this is not dissimilar from the negative externality con context. It's like there was some sort of hidden cost and I suffered it, and you should have been responsible for revealing that hidden cost. Now, in tort law, we could hold lots of people responsible. So if this guy, you know, ends up, uh, the lion uh, flies off the, you know, from the centripetal force and lands on him and, and gores his arm, but he survives, he could sue a lot of people, right? And then the judge would have to say, okay, who at the least cost could have avoided this accident, done something to avoid this accident, if you will. Uh, they could say that the, the you know, maybe it's, it's these guys who decided to do this. Maybe it's the people actually moving around the circle. Or maybe it's the promoter who designed the wall of death and didn't have, you know, bars over the top. And judges in tort law will even say, well, actually, maybe it's you. Maybe you, the guy who got gored by the centripetal lion, were, was the least cost avoider because you didn't have to go to this thing. Everyone knows this thing is dangerous and you walked right up to it and you were just like looking over and there's a lion going around at 70 miles per hour. And so this is just a general concept that it, it makes sense to find if you can or at least develop a theory because quantifying things in complex systems is hard. At least develop a reasonable theory of who's the least cost avoider and then impose your Pigouvian tax on that person, not on someone who it would be too costly for them to avoid the harm. And so another way of thinking about this that, that harkens back to my, my earlier framing, the Pigovian tax looks for a negative externality. That's basically like saying that we have a necessary, we have a, a reason for a law. There's something necessary that needs to be addressed. There is an externality. And the least cost avoider principle says if you do it right, if you found the right person in society to address that cost, that's more of a just law. If you impose that burden of stopping that harm on someone who couldn't do it cheaply or easily, then it's not really a just law. It's kind of unfair. Like, why did that guy or girl end up responsible for amending or stopping the harm? So I think we can go back to Hobbes and St. Augustine, or we can talk about, you know, Cardozo and tort law and Pigou and taxing. But this is the framework I want to look at things in. Now, there's other frameworks for legal ethics and for figuring out whether we should regulate things. There's, there's much more in the law and economics literature than these two concepts. And then there's deontological theories of like, uh, because I am a being with certain you know, rights behind a veil of ignorance or any number of other things uh, we could talk about. But I just want to limit ourselves to these two concepts. So, oh, uh, a little bit more about, um, briefly, about least cost avoider. Uh, this is just a fun fact. There used to be a freight train that would go down 11th Avenue in Manhattan daily, carrying cows to the meatpacking district where they would be slaughtered. This went on all the way up into like the 40s or 50s, actually, which is remarkable. And cowboys used to ride into Manhattan to ride in front of the train to warn people about the train's you know, impending arrival because 11th Avenue for a while was known as the Avenue of Death. And, you know... The, the, the circumstances here are, are kind of radical and complicated, like they might be actually in cryptocurrency networks where you have a lot of participants and it's hard to know, like there's obvious harm that can happen, but who's responsible, who should move. Uh, you know, you might say that, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense to have this train in Manhattan anymore, but it took them a long time to come to that conclusion and to impose that cost, a regulatory tax, if you will, on the railroad. Uh, first, they elevated it, but then it was still noisy and there's like cow effluence falling from the elevated track. And then they, then they said, no, you should do this in Queens, uh, not Manhattan. And that's where the slaughterhouses are today. They're in Queens. And the elevated track is still there and it's a lovely playground for uh, very rich people uh, and tourists in, in Manhattan. It's the High Line. Anyway. So, yes, so this, this is what I was saying earlier. Negative externalities mean regulation might be necessary. Mm. If you can find them, maybe regulation is necessary. Least cost avoider principle, if it's applied well to the right people, maybe the regulation is just. That's just a folk theorem. 
So let's talk now about two of the most relevant categories of laws that impact cryptocurrencies. Um, securities laws and anti-money laundering laws. And if you don't know anything about these two, it's okay because we're starting from first principles here. So what's the negative externality that securities laws seeks to address? I think this is a, you know, I, I just wrote this, um, but it's based on reading securities laws for a long time and talking to policymakers and looking at the, at the preamble of the 33 Act. I think the heart of it is there's this negative externality that happens where we have malinvestment, which could mean all sorts of things like society's resources are going to the wrong products or, or, or purposes. It could mean you know, people, vulnerable people are getting harmed uh, because they're losing their money. So malinvestment is occurring because of fraud, misrepresentation, or a lack of, of effective disclosure of relevant facts about the investment by the issuer of a security. And this is fairly intuitive. It's intuitive in the cryptocurrency space, where Mr. Mayweather decided to promote, you know, stocks.com ICO and make statements that might lead some people to think this is a profitable opportunity uh, without any grounding for that and without any registration or disclaimers or other statements that the SEC says you should make to better share information about the investment that you're promoting um, before vulnerable people potentially go out and look at your Instagram and say, oh, I should buy that. So, so why do you say this is a case of uh, negative externality? It seems like you know it's a buyer beware sort of thing. Uh, uh, I view it more as you know, there's, a, there's a market failure or yes. see people. Uh, I think which is not necessarily an externality. You know that's the true. Who's going to suffer is definitely the guy who bought the stock after you know seeing his favorite. I think that's right. We can think of, so this gets into sort of a protectionist versus libertarian view of negative externalities. Um, to try and stay fairly neutral, I'll just say that I think negative externalities might represent at least some form of market failure. And then the least cost avoider might be the purchaser of the unregistered security. In which case, caveat emptor, there is harm in the world in inefficient markets but we're willing to let the costs of those inefficiencies be borne by ignorant people who nonetheless, despite probably knowing better, buy these things. So I would tend to attribute more of this to um, basically informational asymmetries. Absolutely. If the company's running, you, you're, you're going to buy their stock, but you're not there on yes. the day, day And what securities law tries to do is basically have the company report. Yes. Right. Uh, you know, right, which I've abstracted. So that, that is exactly what securities law do, and I've abstracted that into a kind of tax on not reporting, which I think is a fair way of just speaking more broadly about these things. Because then we can speak also in the same way about anti-money laundering law, just to build a more comprehensive theory of these things. So, um, yeah. What's the negative externality that anti-money laundering laws seek to address? Well... It's the ease with which a criminal can hide the profits of their crimes in the financial system. And this is, this is an interesting negative externality. Um, I think it exists. I think there's, there's, there's definitely a case where by providing a service, just like the factory is building widgets, you create some effect in society that's undesirable, uh, like pollution. And a bank, by providing banking services, may, knowingly or not, give shelter to flows of funds that are essentially criminal or immoral. Uh, and that is a necessary fact of them operating, just like pollution is a necessary fact of a factory operating. And so I think you can also think of this one as a negative externality produced by the productive activity of running a bank. And so I think this is the ground truth of why we have both of these laws. If anyone disagrees, feel free to. Maybe you could catch the negative externality there with uh, money laundering is, is just crime, more crime, uh, facilitation of crime. Like so I would agree if money laundering had like strong scienter requirements, knowledge requirements. And it doesn't always. Um, if you are found operating an unlicensed money transmission business, for example, 
and you're not doing the KYC AML that you were supposed to because you never licensed. It doesn't matter if you had any knowledge at all of illegal money moving through your institution. The mere fact that you didn't register and you didn't have a program in place is something that you can be found guilty of a federal felony for, a really serious federal felony. So I think in some cases, uh, money laundry is obviously a crime in itself, or at least it's accomplice liability for the crime itself. But in some cases, what we charge pe people with is, is, is merely by being part of the infrastructure, you've facilitated a problem. And so we need you to spend money, even if you haven't done anything wrong, to stop that problem. Yeah, it, I, I, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. I think it's that we want to stop crime. And even though this is fairly attenuated from the crime that's over there of maybe human trafficking or whatever, right. money laundering facilitates human trafficking. Banking facilitates money laundering, so. Sure, sure. I'm just saying that within a strict liability regime, I have trouble saying that the person who had no knowledge that the money over their, over their systems was related to human trafficking is themselves criminal. It may be regulatory deficient, but I don't think that's criminal unless there's intent to, 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 to be an accomplice to or to, to facilitate human trafficking. And, I, I, and this is something I do feel kind of strongly about because we treat, we treat violations of anti-money laundering as if they're really, um, in law we have malum prohibitum and malum in se. And malum prohibitum is you can't do this because somebody in government said it's not something to be done. Whereas malum in se is this idea that there are some things that you can't do because they are truly hor horrible. Murder is a malum in se crime. Whereas like parking on the wrong side of the street is a malum prohibitive, prohibitum crime. And I actually think most money laundry, though not all of it, might actually fall into more of a malum prohibitum. And certainly when people are uh, accused of simply not registering with FinCEN, and we have no evidence that there was even money laundering, it, it's hard to say that that's not malum prohibitum rather than malum in se. So, oh yeah, this, this is fairly self-explanatory with respect to um, the negative externality of money laundering from the excellent AMC show, Breaking Bad. Uh, so who's the least cost avoider of this securities law negative externality? Well, the securities laws suggest, and we can either agree or disagree, that it's the issuer. We could imagine others. We were just saying maybe it's the purchaser who's the least cost avoider. We could even say maybe it's the government. We could have a system of securities laws where the government just focuses on investor education to stop people from buying dumb crap. Uh, and they bear all the costs of that rather than imposing costs on others. We can imagine lots of systems, but securities law says the issuer and the promoter. So adjacent people to the issuer who are really hawking this thing, hence the Floyd Mayweather is not the issuer of stocks.com, but could be held responsible. And so in a, in a nutshell, Securities law boils down to this. Is there a thing being sold as an investment? And is there a person upon whom investors rely? And if so, the thing is a security, and the issuer, or the person upon whom investors re rely, needs to register and do disclosures to correct information asymmetries to make up for this potential negative externality of malinvestment. And you can look at these two questions as, as interestingly kind of also linked to our unnecessary versus unjust. Um, if the thing is being sold as investment and people expect profits from it, like they do with investments, then there's, there's evidence here that there could be malinvestment. This might be necessary. And if there's a person upon whom investors rely, we can f start to find a least cost avoider maybe, because there's this one person. There's a singular person who, if they shared more information, could really correct any of the potential negative externalities from malinvestment. Uh, so the intuition here is that we can't regulate everything as securities, because at a certain point, that wouldn't make sense. So gold is sold as an investment. But if you're just buying commodity gold, there's no person upon whom investors are relying for the long-term value of their investment. Gold goes up and down in price thanks to the actions of thousands and thousands of people in a free market or a generally free market. So 
you really you did meet one. There's definitely the 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 possibility of malinvestment and a negative externality, but we can't find a least cost avoider that makes any sense in this context. Or maybe we could, but we just don't want to. We need to draw a line somewhere. Maybe all of the potential people who could stop someone from investing in gold are too many. That securities law style disclosures to address information asymmetries don't make sense. Like, is every gold miner going to be obligated to publish a prospectus about how much gold they're going to mine this year? That seems strange and unnecessary. Is this also, does it rely on the fact that there are many gold vendors? Uh, what if you change gold to the diamonds and, uh, and there's like... And there's a cartel. So it's interesting. I mean, I've never seen securities laws applied that way, but if you really had a strong cartel that controlled the full supply of a commodity and could manipulate it and things like that, uh, it would start to look like a good case for securities regulation. Now that said, we do have also commodities regulation, where if you can manipulate the price of the thing, we can get you then. So we'd probably get you through commodities regulation rather than saying, you're a strong cartel that can manipulate the price. You need to do disclosures. We'd say, you're a strong cartel that can manipulate the price. We're going after you for manipulation of a commodity rather than failing to disclose facts about a commodity because that doesn't make as much sense as failing to disclose facts about a security, which is more like a share of Apple stock is the paradigmatic security, whereas there's this guy, Tim Cook, who if he doesn't speak honestly to the investing public and speak completely, i.e. give them enough information, then we can obviously see why there would be uh, a chance for negative externalities, mispricing of Apple stock, investment booms, bubbles, things like that. And they could easily be addressed if we just got him to say what he should say about the number of shares in circulation, about the the, the, the board of directors composition of Apple and the other basic disclosures that securities laws ask for. We're going to talk about bugs um, at some point, the bug disclosure stuff. Or do, you, do you want to wait? This is pretty high level. Um, so with any particular asset, we can engage in a classification exercise. Why is the asset desirable? Uh, and what backs up the value? So if the asset is desirable for its use, then we have less chance of malinvestment because people are just they're treating this thing like something they, they need and they're, maybe we'll dispense of it quickly to, to perform some function. Whereas if they're holding onto it for a while, obviously the chances of uh, malinvestment are real. They have expectations of future profits. They, um, they could be harmed if the things they believed about the thing happen to be untrue and the value plummets. And then what backs up that value? The network. In other words, a large number of people, the entire gold industry, the entire number of people who trade gold actively on several otherwise unaffiliated exchanges, or is it an issuer who really backs up that value? Is it like Tim Cook, who makes most of the command and control decisions at Apple, who's providing the value of an Apple share? And you've got intermediate cases like the Libra Association which decides what the value of the basket that the Libra will represent, Facebook's new cryptocurrency, just to give an intermediate cryptocurrency example. And yet there's also a network of users, and the basket is composed of things that in theory don't fluctuate much, so how much control do they have, I guess would be the operative question with Libra. And so if we have these two axes. I don't know if you've seen this, uh, if you've ever seen me present this before, but I've been doing this for a little while. We can graph these things uh, in, in two-dimensional space, which is fun. Um, Maybe there's some things where they're definitely treated as investments and we really rely on the issuers. These are paradigmatic securities like equities in shares in publicly traded corporations, for example. There are commodities that a lot of people might use for scientific purposes but also seek as investments, maybe because they're scarce, like gold. Um, and the value comes from no person in particular but from a wide variety of persons acting in an unaffiliated way. There are things that oil or real estate that we might treat as an investment, but generally speaking, we want to use them, and that's what markets in them are for. And you know, their long-term value is dependent on any number of things, like whether everyone starts using electric cars, whether people continue to want to pay absurd prices to live in San Francisco, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Member-run, worker-owned type cooperatives, we could put over here. Uh, if you own a stake in the, in the profit-making you know, enterprise that you are also running, then 
it's definitely an, an investment. You have a stake in your, in your um, business, um, but it's you and your compatriots who run it together. You're not looking to some single person who isn't you and your compatriots to provide the value of the investment. It's, it's a network again. And then down here, things that are useful and we rely on the issuer, um, and usually there's not speculation about the value of these things, are things like uh, loyalty points or uh, golf course memberships. Uh, you could put tickets to a show there, and you could put like, this is a unique case um, from securities law. So there's, there's case law about all of these things and about whether they're securities or not. And this is an interesting case where people were sold warehouse receipts to barrels full of whiskey. And they were told by the promoter, you're just buying a barrel of whiskey. And here's your receipt. You can come pick up your multi-ton or like half-ton barrel of giant barrel of whiskey whenever you want. But I'll hold it for you. And by the way, if you let me hold it for you for 15 years, it's single malt. It'll be really good at that point. Um, and I'll also probably help you find a buyer at that point. Just give me the money, and I'll hold on to the, you know, the barrel. So at this point, we can see more of a rely on the issuer, and the thing isn't actually being used. People are just being told that this is a good investment. And yeah, there's a whiskey barrel in the warehouse, so they kind of just bought that. But the SEC says, yeah, we really think that that warehouse receipt is basically a quasi-share of the whiskey distillery. No one is actually just buying whiskey. They're buying part of the stock, literally, of the whiskey distillery, their stock of whiskey. And so that was a security. And interestingly, on the golf course membership uh, front, golf course memberships, even if they're transferable, are not securities. Even though you do really rely on the, you know, Trump to make the golf course nice or not, or whoever, maybe not Trump. I wouldn't rely on Trump. Um, he's got other things to do. That's all I mean. He just can't run golf courses all the time. Uh, but the SEC says, no, people buy these memberships because they want to golf, not because they want an investment. And yet, there are some cases where memberships were pre-sold, which is a fun word in the cryptocurrency space, before the golf course existed. And they said, it's going to be a really great golf course. It's going to be huge. It's going to have 18 holes, which all golf courses do. It'll be beautiful. You should pay me, I'll give you a discount on an early membership, and then once it's built, you'll be able to play golf. That's a security, according to the relevant securities laws, because it's, it's complete faith in the issuer to actually deliver. There's no way you can golf today. You're just waiting for them to do what they said and build the thing, and they've sold a finite number of memberships, kind of like shares, in their future golf course. So from a token standpoint, all crowdfunding now uh, considered securities under that? Because were you pre-sale, right, most of these crowdfunding campaigns? So the interesting thing is um, Kickstarter, it never came up, maybe because these things were small enough amounts of money, generally speaking, and this was sort of like, well, let's let innovation bloom. You could have made a very credible argument in the early days of Kickstarter, these are securities and the SEC could have come for them. Um, to my knowledge, they didn't. I actually haven't dug deeply into the case law of, like, Kickstarter. Clearly, right, the utility uh, driven, right, it's on the bottom right there. Mm -hmm. and the money that the people get in Kickstarter campaigns can be, you know, massive. Phenomenal. Yeah, and sometimes they don't deliver any product. Bit, yeah, you know, they get a lot. totally agree. And so they are definitely on the edge. I think right now they're out, but this is, not, so, it's important to get a handle on how legal reasoning works. It's not, it's not mathematical as in proofs, despite my attempt to graph it. It's fuzzy. Um, and so, yeah, there are tokens that are exactly like all of these things, I would argue. And that's a huge, huge fun fact. Like, there's tokens that could represent equity. There's tokens that could be a claim to a, an object in a warehouse. Um, and yet you're relying on the issuer, and you're never actually going to go pick up the thing in the warehouse. Um, there's tokens that are you know, promises of some future really nice thing that you'll be able to access that doesn't exist yet. And there's tokens that are promises of some really nice thing that you can access today. So maybe the golf course that's pre-sold memberships is a security or the ICO, if you will, if the network's not running. And maybe the running network is not a security. 
according to the same divergent case law on golf courses. For just, just to give one, one potential avenue for making these arguments. I think there are tokens that are kind of like digital oil or fuel. Uh, Ethereum even uses this term with respect to gas, and I, I don't think that's, uh, that's them just abusing it or trying to look more like a commodity. I, think it was a, I don't even think they knew about commodities or securities laws when they chose the term gas. It's just what people do with Ether, among other things, in order to run smart contracts. There's uh, plans for tokens that will be like real estate, where the, the network will really just do distributed file storage, and you'll have some sort of highly linked inbuilt currency. Um, so you could kind of think of it as like terabytes instead of square feet, maybe. This might be a stretch. Feel free to disagree. Yeah. Is there any, any ruling, for example, or anything you know about uh, CryptoKitties, for example? How would you, how would you place it on the... So they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're more complicated because they're non-fungible. Informational asymmetry there. They, they of can course, make more, you totally. Know how they work yeah. It's really weird. Yeah, I I think the non fungibility thing is a is a hiccup in the analysis. It might not be deadly at all. It's just a whole nother. All of these things, like each unit, is mostly like the next. I mean, especially in the token space, like one ETH is like one ETH, and that that actually helps provide something called horizontal commonality in the securities laws test that say that everybody's fates will rise and fall together, which is one of the hallmarks of it being a security. Um, and there's even maybe like member-run cooperatives, which might not be securities because it really is member-run. And, and the SEC generally doesn't treat the trading of shares in a closely held and member-run company as public securities, publicly traded securities that need to be registered. So if the DAO was genuinely like actually decentralized rather than having the curator as like a choke point that people were relying upon, maybe it would have had a better argument that it's not a security, the DAO token. Um, it was definitely a profit, you know, oriented token. It was, it was a venture capital fund, but the idea was that it was supposed to be member run. And the SEC said, no, it's not member run. There's this curator, this promoter, and there's the people that wrote the software. So we're still relying on an issuer. So this is the intuition behind this whole thing. And at this point, it should be obvious. The Securities Exchange Commission's jurisdiction, which is the broadest of all securities regulators, but other securities regulators could expand their jurisdiction, might look something like this. Or it might look something like this, depending on how much they want to stretch their interpretation of the relevant law and whether a judge agrees with them. Or it might look like this, and you know, Coin Center tries to generally advocate for a more narrow interpretation of securities laws, but we would definitely say that like, if, if pre-selling a golf course membership is a security, then pre-selling a useful token is probably a security too. I just have trouble disagreeing with that statement. Um, how does the potential infungibility, unfungibility of cryptocurrencies uh, I guess affect this view? Like if, because of the history of the currency, each coin really might not be like the other coin? Mm -hmm. Does that affect the argument? Fungibility breaks down at that point. I think, so the SEC concerns itself with the economic realities of a transaction. So it wouldn't even be relevant to them uh, unless fungibility was breaking down so much that some were worth more than others. The fact that in reality, they're all basically trading at the same, I, I, I just don't think it would actually be all that relevant to their analysis. The OFAC thing we were talking about yesterday, Oh, yeah. There's no doubt that there are things that could harm fungibility and could lead some Bitcoin. I mean, virgin, it's a terrible word, virgin Bitcoins that come from a, a, a miner have never touched any other transactions are generally traded at a premium because they're regarded either as uh, collectible, that seems sort of doubtful, or as assuredly clean from any past illegal transactions. Is there ever a legal distinction to a potential third axis here, which is whether you have some sort of voting rights over the issuer? Like, you know, for stock, there's like common stock, voting stock, mm -hmm. cases. So all of those would be stock, though. That's the thing. And the, this is a map of when things are or, and are not securities. And so if, if things, as I said, really are member run, and there's no limited partners upon whom the general, uh, yeah, limited partners who are relying upon the general partners. Um, if it's really member run, then it actually could fall out of securities laws, potentially. Would it ever make a distinction for crypto assets if you're buying voting shares or not? Like, is a proof of stake system different than 
you know, a general ERC-20 token that doesn't let you sort of vote over the future of the project? It could be indicia. Uh, I mean, there's also the Reeves family resemblance test, which is a separate test from the Howey test, which this comes from. And so maybe you could make an argument that because this looks like a typical debt liability and other factors are associated with it, it there, there, there are other tests. But just looking at the core of how the SEC has treated these things, it's always through the Howey analysis, which focuses primarily on expectation of profits and reliance on a third party. Uh, other indicia of things that are typically like securities, like most securities have voting rights, um, is not going to help you, but it, it's, not, it's not prominent in this test. And so I guess the point that I want to make, um, sticking Hobbes here, is I kind of think that stuff that is genuinely, and I don't mean to suggest that everything that claims to be useful or a so-called utility token is really here. But if it was really here, and people really were seeking it for its use value, then a law regulating it as a security is unnecessary, uh, a la Hobbes' unnecessary laws, because we don't have the potential for malinvestment, because people aren't actually holding this thing with the expectation of profits that could be disappointed from information asymmetries. And I think if you extended securities laws too far in this direction, we're kind of in the unjust territory. It seems like, yeah, there are investment expectations that can just be disappointed. Like, you could, you, could, um, you could buy gold and you could lose your hat, especially during the you know, the big bubbles around gold investment. Um, but is there a person we can find in the gold industry that we could justly say is the low cost avoider of your bad choice to buy gold? I don't think so. It should probably be you who's responsible in this case. This should probably be a caveat emptor regime. But so in the, in the bottom case you said for utility, uh, I mean, who should be, why isn't there any risk that the, that the claimed utility uh, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't exist? Like Theranos, for example, totally. that person is under securities law, right? Or is, uh, Shares of Theranos are, and the malinvestment around that was in large part due to improper disclosures made by Theranos of like, what their projected revenue and things like that would be. Um, but if you bought the blood testing machine and it didn't work the way it was supposed to, that would be addressed by other areas of law, yeah. Either tort, it could be the, F, uh, the FDA, it could be the Federal Trade Commission saying this is an unfair and deceptive product. Uh, and those are all also applicable to cryptocurrencies. So when I, when I exclude them from one area of law, I'm not being an anarchist who says they shouldn't be regulated at all. I'm just talking now about securities laws. I, I do think the FTC is a, is, would be a valuable regulator of so-called useful tokens. So one of the dirty tricks I, we could kind of see in ICOs who, who pretended to be utility tokens is that they would say, you know, our token would later let you buy, you know, something on the shared rides. Yeah. But they never said what the exchange rate, you know, one token, one ride would have nailed down the value and, you know, the buyer then knows pretty much what he's buying. Yeah. But uh, just letting this thing float is the thing that made bubbles possible. Mm -hmm. made so how do you how would you uh, you know uh, put that in this framework? Do you have any? So I suppose letting it float makes it a bit more like gambling, like you're buying it and you're not immediately going to convert it into the useful service. You're going to hope that you're going to get a lot more useful service than people currently expect, and so that goes into that, you know, um, maybe people are suddenly buying it for investment purposes, not for its usefulness. Yeah. But that said, I, I think it should like there's there's interesting economic benefits to building a system that doesn't that that pre-sells things or sells things at a price that can adjust in as far as the number of goods you get in the future for you know shifts. And so, if it's relatively bounded, I mean, you know, and people, right. people started speculating on this just as a you know it was a totally floating token. And right. They're, they're they're in it lie all the profits as well. Yep. How much time do I have? Uh, yeah, I was about to say we're, we should wrap it up soon. Okay. I will wrap it up soon. Um, Anti-money laundering laws. Least cost avoider. Choke points in the financial system. What do I mean? Um, this is from Treasury. The term money transmission services means the acceptance of currency funds or other value that substitutes for currency from one person 
and the transmission of currency funds or other value that substitutes for currency to another location or person by any means. You are a choke point. A wants to pay B, and you are in the middle. You accept from A and transmit to B. Or A wants to move from location A to B, you facilitate that by at least transiently achieving custody over the thing. And with respect to cryptocurrency, this, with respect to all the financial system, this makes sense. A necessary link in the, in the movement of money is definitely the least cost avoider to illegal money flowing through that channel. Assuming that we're, we're ready to address that negative externality. Now, maybe we just don't like the idea of financial surveillance at all, and we don't want to address the negative externality, but I think this makes sense for a least cost avoider. And with respect to cryptocurrencies, FinCEN in May 2019 says, the determining factor, if you're that least cost avoider, if you're that obligated entity, is whether the person acting as an intermediary has total and independent control over the value. And so they're really talking about, say, a Coinbase who holds your cryptocurrency for you, or a Bank of America which has your bank balance for you. They're not talking about, at least not yet, and this could all change, of course, they're not talking about, say, a miner who's one of several paths through a network that your transaction could end up clearing through. These are essential paths. These are paths that actually could misdirect or move or completely fail to transact on your behalf. And then you're out of luck, necessary intermediaries who have actual independent control over the value. And I think this makes sense. Now, just like we came to the question, who's the least cost avoider in a bad investment in gold? Can we impose that obligation on every gold miner in the world? That seems wrong. It should probably be the person. We come to the question of, if we wanted to find a new least cost avoider for a world without choke points, because suddenly people aren't transmitting through Bank of America all the time, but instead transmitting through the Ethereum network, can we rightly say that every node on the Ethereum network is the least cost avoider to stop money laundering and therefore needs to automatically report the transaction information on the Ethereum network, including the identities of the participants, without a warrant from a judge for the search and seizure of that information. That is radically different. I don't think this is least cost avoider, and I don't think this is constitutional either, which was my stretch topic for today. So yeah, fails on St. Augustine, I'd say, to make every node or maybe even every miner, depending on how decentralized the system is, a money services business who needs to basically surveil the users of the network. And so far, regulators have generally agreed with the approach I've described today. You can check out more at this link with respect to CFTC policy on authors of software and whether they'd be liable. And you can check out these two links if you're interested in the anti-money laundering stuff, which has now been exported through FATF to the rest of the world. So this is actually not a parochial US concern. This is global. And we don't have time for our stretch topic, but I'm happy to give that presentation to anyone who's interested at another time. So there, there is this, uh, when you presented this uh, thoughts on uh, whether certain regulations should apply or should not, in a, in a principled way coming from sort of much more rudimentary uh, First principles, yeah. yeah. So how much regulators like use this calculus to like derive at least you know consistent uh, <laughs> implications to regulation, or are they driven more by you know, other? So, yeah. so I think mostly regulators are driven by a faithful interpretation of the existing statutory law and their own previously promulgated regulations, and then you have to ask yourself whether those were promulgated wisely. And most of those, in fact, all of those with respect to securities laws and anti-money laundering laws were promulgated or passed into law by Congress before cryptocurrencies existed. And there's something that I think is really interesting there. I think they were actually pretty wise in maybe a, a, a tacit knowledge kind of sense. I think a lot of the first principles calculus that I'm explaining goes into lawmaking when it's done well. And I'm, I'm usually sometimes have a lack of faith in the wisdom of policy, like the state money transmission licensing framework. But learning more about securities laws and anti-money laundering laws by being at Coin Center for five years, I actually have much more respect for those laws. And I think they're, they're actually surprisingly well calibrated, which is something that unfortunately some blockchain advocates will tell you like, ah, 
securities laws don't let me raise money. I'm like, well, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should just build good tech and raise money from like Andreessen Horowitz, like a normal person. <laughs> well, some, some do argue that a lot of these laws address yesterday's problems, not today's problems. Right. And, and so uh, this would be a rebuttal to them. This would say these laws address kind of timeless problems that all go all the way back to St. Augustine and <laughs> Thomas Hobbes. Regarding the negative externalities, as far as I know, uh, each transaction made through blockchain mm. consume a lot of energy, mm. which indirectly means uh, pollution. Mm -hmm that it, mm, we might consider as a negative externalities and who should bear the cost of it? Because it, it, it becomes a social cost. I mean, people talk about building you know, carbon credits and things like that. That would be fairly uh, directly a type of Pagovian tax, uh, one that would be transferable, which makes it a little bit more like cool 20th century than 18th century. But if it applied to regular industries, then it should apply to Bitcoin, I'd say. Uh, that said, I, I think actually a lot of Bitcoin mining, um, and I'm just saying this off the cuff, uh, we have a research paper uh, that just says that the existing estimates aren't great um, and, and, and says, like, here's the problem with their analysis. I don't have a research paper that says anything conclusively because it's very hard to get empirical data. But I, I, anecdotally, we hear that lots of Bitcoin miners are actually in places with cheap hydroelectric power or geothermal power. And if you think about it, a Bitcoin miner can be located anywhere in the world. They don't have to be at a shipping port because their, their only inputs and outputs are internet and electricity. So they can go to places in the world where electricity is cheap because nobody lives there. And there seems to be a lot of sunlight or a lot of geothermal or a lot of water up high that will come down. And so it might not be the case that you find that all Bitcoin mining is generating this pollution issue. And they might be the early adopters of green energy is, is one pet theory of mine, but that needs empirical evidence. So you were about to maybe conclude with privacy law, and I was just going to say that there's another negative externality. Yes. We interact with digital things all, our, all of our lives, and uh, one of the negative externalities, like suit from factories, is the little bits of information that's about us that are everywhere, and maybe Bitcoin is actually good at uh, you know, or in other cryptocurrencies that avoiding these. I think that's absolutely right, yeah. yeah. And society's just waking up to that, right? And I, and I, think, um, I think there's actually a case to be made that the Bank Secrecy Act, which is the model for international AML regimes as well, um, when applied in certain ways that it is currently applied, even to regular financial institutions, might be unconstitutional. Um, and you know, there was a court case that, that said that the Bank Secrecy Act is constitutional in the 1970s when it was first promulgated. Um, back in the 1970s, how many transactions would you ask your bank to make on your behalf per week? One, two, and then you make all your transactions in cash. Now, they see every transaction you make with your cards um, or online. It's a mountain more data. And the, the laws have changed. Uh, such that they need to automatically report suspicious activity reports, and they file millions of these every year. This has all changed since the court case that held that the Bank Secrecy Act was constitutional. Uh, if you think of the Constitution as like a, another meta law to ensure some degree of, like, we only want necessary laws and just laws, um, maybe, maybe we're just waiting for that day of reckoning with respect to American values or liberal values and mass surveillance, warrantless surveillance, which is what the bank secrecy is today, rather than maybe when it first. I mean, I, I attended... Uh, That's the second talk, yeah. yeah I attended one of uh, the FATF's uh, meetings. They had an open day. Yeah. There were a lot of speakers from industry, and what struck me is that everybody was talking about uh, big data, data pools, data lakes, you know, more, let's bring everyone, you know, and you have an international body, you know, with 40 or so countries, uh, talking about joining data and talking about look, uh, looking for terrorist networks and connecting the dots and and I was appalled right and I, I was the only one in the room that was pretty much looking at them you know with horror yeah um, so I, I don't think we're in for a yeah, I agree we're, we're in for a bumpy road in that, in that sense let's uh, thank the speaker and take the discussion to the break and <laughs> next talk will start at 10:50.